Uh, my name's Vicki Sauer. Uh, this is Susan LaBelle. We work here at the library and the adult services department. And Connie, our supervisor, is here. Um, this is a dual program tonight. We're so lucky. Um, it's our summer reading finale. If any of you are here from summer reading, I know you are. And then we have Jerry Burton here tonight, our, um, our uh, special guest, to talk about the history of the Corvette. So we're excited. We're glad you came. Before we get started, there's a, just a little bit of housekeeping. I want to remind you about a couple programs. Number one, we have an exhibit upstairs of uh, Detroit automotive styling from 1946 to 1973. And I don't know whether you saw the artwork displayed, but it is in the, over by the adult services desk on some white panels. So I hope you enjoy that. These are Detroit automotive designers' original sketches. And so we've got them on display until August 25th. Then we have, summer's not over yet, so August 24th, on Sunday, we have a writer coming, a local Birmingham uh, writer, Bill Morris. He's going to be here uh, reading from his new book, his novel, Motor City Burning. So he's going to be talking about the, um, the Tigers 1968 championship game and also an unsolved murder from the previous summer's riot. He's going to be playing background songs from this time period. Uh, John Lee Hooker, Stevie Wonder, Smokey Robinson, uh, Miles Davis, and The Temptations. So that should be a good program. Oh, 2 o'clock, 2 p.m. on Sunday the 24th. So don't go away yet. Summer's not over. We're still having a couple programs here. He's going to sell his books. They're available through BookBeat if you'd like to pre-order one. Now... Just a little bit more. <laughs> um, this, is, this is a library. <laughs> this is a library. So, of course, I have to tell you a little bit about our collection. So I've got some Birmingham local book history books over here, everything from Saunders to um, Hudson's. Uh, what else do I have over there? Oh, Dream Cruise. So it's, it's a nice series, and they're here in our 900s, and of course a librarian would be happy to help you find them. And then, um, just coincidentally, this is a new book on ice cream, and it, it uh, is de designed or divided into sections of the United States, and the Midwest is included here. And one of our ice cream stores, called Treat Dreams, which is in Ferndale, um, has a recipe in here. And his ice cream recipe is Michigan Salad ice cream and he says that lettuce is not included <laughs> so so you never know what you're going to find at the library so come and explore all right let's get to the main part of the program so we are lucky to have Jerry Burton here today an automotive historian who works across the street from us at MR, MRM McCann um, and he has a long, illustrative history um, with the Corvette. Uh, he has written three books, and he brought one here tonight. He's going to be talking about um, Zora Arcus Zuntov. 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 Thank you. Um, the creator of the Corvette. How many of you own a Corvette or had a Corvette in your life? So this is a good crowd. <laughs> no, you don't win a book. But... <laughs> I know, my mother had a vet. She had a 1960 Corvette. She always wanted a Corvette, a yellow Corvette. So my father bought her a white one. It was the times, you know, you did what your dad wanted you to do. So, um, so, so um, very little choice. So um, Jerry's going to be talking tonight about his books. Um, just a little bit of history here. Uh, he's a 20-year history as editor and associate producer with Corvette Quarterly magazine. Um, he has been inducted into the Great Hall of Bloomington Gold in 19, or 19, 2012. And this Labor Day, he's going to be inducted into the National Corvette Museum's Corvette Hall of Fame. So, <laughs> his credentials continue. You might have seen him on Speed TV, the Discovery Channel, or the History Channel. 
um, and he's been working on or co-producing the television documentary on Zora, Zora uh, that will air in Zora's home country in Russia um, this fall, this November, in front of 50 million people. And his whole life story is just an amazing story. And so why don't I stop talking and turn it over to Jerry. Well, thank you again for uh, coming out tonight. On the, I don't know if it's still raining out there or what, but uh, it was uh, pretty, pretty nasty the last couple of days. And uh, so I appreciate you being here. Um, and especially to listen to me talk about one of my favorite all-time people, Zora Arkus Duntoff. Um, this, the, the opportunity to write his biography was really a life-changing event for me probably the hardest thing I ever did because um, I, I had gotten to know Zora pretty well through my activities at uh, uh, on the Chevrolet account at Campbell Ewald. Again, I edited the Corvette Owner Magazine, Corvette Quarterly, and uh, I had worked on Corvette advertising and so forth. So I had a chance to get to know Zora, and he was a really uh, easy guy to get to know. Um, Unlike a lot of, you know, if you've ever met certain celebrities, they kind of tend to look right through you and just can't wait to move on to someone more interesting. And Zora wasn't like that at all. He was very uh, engaging and um, easy to get to know. And uh, I, I really appreciated that about him. And he was, there was something about his personality that was just unlike any other person I've ever met. So. Anyway, I'll move on to my first slide here, which is really, uh, you know, who was Zora Arkus Duntoff? Well, first off, he was not the father of the Corvette. That distinction belongs to Harley Earl, who, as head of General Motors design staff, produced the first concept Corvette called EX122. It was shown at the um, Waldorf Astoria Ballroom in January of 1953. Um, but Zora was, Zora was so taken by that Corvette at, at the Motorama that he pulled out all the stops to try to find a job at GM. And he felt like the car, while it was a beautiful, beautiful, gorgeous car, the, the, the most beautiful car he had ever seen before, but he knew that underneath it was just a lot of uh, Chevrolet parts in the drawer and nothing, even though it was a credible sports car for its day, don't get me wrong, but Zora had the vision to say, God, what could I do with this using the resources of a company like GM? So he instantly had vision and went to work to try to uh, make his vision a reality. I'm going to give you a quick rundown in terms of what Zora's, some of Zora's accomplishments were. Uh, he witnessed the Russian Revolution um, in 1917, was educated in Russia and Germany's finest technical schools. He joined the French Air Force in World War II um, and trained as a bombardier, uh, escaped from Nazi-occupied France during World War II, consulted for top U.S. defense companies once he, once he came to the United States on board a refugee ship through Ellis Island, appropriately enough, in December 1940. Started his own war munitions company once he got to uh, America. Contributed greatly to the war effort. Uh, helped develop an atomic compressor and may have been involved in an atomic-powered airplane, believe it or not. He raced at Indianapolis. At least he tried to qualify for the Indy 500. He never made the field, but he tried two years in a row and uh, raced at Le Mans four years in a row, winning his class twice for Porsche as a GM employee, <laughs> I might add. <laughs> and he came to GM in 1953 where he helped drive the Corvette into you know, sports car immortality. So why is Zora celebrated today? Well, he took many risks to ensure the success of the Corvette. Um, you know, functioning in a culture that really didn't understand sports cars. You know, we take performance and racing for granted today, and it's nothing to see, turn on the TV on Sunday afternoon and see Chevys flashing across the finish line at Daytona or Talladega or what have you. 
But none of that existed back when Zora came to GM. Uh, GM was a relative babe in the woods when it came to building performance cars or racing cars. And uh, when Ed Cole hired Zora in 1953 to work in, in the Chevrolet Research and Development Department, he said, look, here's a guy that can really help us establish a beachhead in terms of performance and racing. And that's exactly what Zora came to do you know, with his background in Europe. Uh, but the sparks flew when he came to GM because here's this outsider. Uh, English was his fourth language. So he comes into GM, the classic duck, you know, the classic fish out of water. And, uh, you know, no one really respected him that much. They thought he's just getting in the way. He's a nuisance. We're here to produce high volume transportation for uh, a post-war culture in America, and what's this guy doing with this silly little sports car? So, needless to say, Zora had his work cut out for him. Um, Zora is probably best known for his association with the Stingray. This is, he's actually leaning next to a 1965 big block there, you can tell by the hood. Um, but this car, you know, is when, if you're going to use the word iconic to describe an automobile, this, this one certainly deserves it. Uh, Zora didn't design this car. He designed the, the underpinnings of the car. The car itself was a combination of Pete Brock and Bill Mitchell and Larry Shinoda and a number of other deserving people who created this absolutely traffic-stopping car. Um, and it became one of the most enduring designs of all time. Also elevated Corvette into a whole new platform of performance from where it was before, thanks to things like an independent rear suspension that Zora designed. A um, little quick background here. Zora was born in Brussels of Russian parents, Christmas Day, 1909. Uh, his parents had met in Brussels as university students studying abroad, and they moved back to Petrograd or St. Petersburg when Zora was only a year old. So he was raised in Russia up until about 17. Uh, this, his mom is sitting in the middle there. I think that's her sister, and then his dad is uh, standing there. Rather handsome dad. And kind of a very determined mom there, as you can tell by the look on her face. She was very left-leaning in her politics. In fact, she was a member of the Socialist Revolutionary Party, participating in the 1917 Russian Revolution. Uh, after the Lenin came to power, she landed a high-level position in the uh, in the Lenin government as a cultural minister. And Jock Arcus was a mining engineer by training and uh, very soft-spoken in contrast to her. She was very fiery and passionate. Um, and uh, Jacques was kind of a quiet intellectual and really encouraged Zora to read and discover the world. Zora had a brother, Yura, who was seven years younger than him. And Zora, as a, as a boy, often played the role of caretaker to uh, his brother, Yura, but uh, usually got into trouble with his parents. Zora found a gun at an early age that he used to protect the family bread rations. Even though they were kind of in the privileged class, thanks to his mother's position, they still um, had to collect bread rations like everybody else. Rachel was kind of a pretty unusual woman. She was having affairs with numerous men uh, while she was raising Zora and Yura. And one of her affairs happened to be with the Russian artist Mark Chagall, the same guy who designed the, the roof of the Paris Opera House and went on to many other great works. Um, but her most passionate affair was with an electrical engineer by the name of Joseph Duntoff. And uh, Joseph Duntoff actually was invited to move into the house with Zora's real father. And, uh, you know, Zora had two fathers in the same household. Zora liked and respected both men. And uh, the uh, 
uh, eventually, you know, added uh, his stepfather's name Duntoff to his real last name Arcus. So that's why we call him Zora Arcus Duntoff. He did this much later in life once he was in America, by the way. Zora was kind of a daredevil growing up. He liked to do risky things. Uh, very interested in street cars. He knew the names of all the street cars that operated in St. Petersburg. Um, he was interested in bicycles, ships, trains, motorcycles, automobiles, anything. And actually designed and built a propeller-driven snowmobile at age 15 using an old aircraft engine. When Zora was 16 years old, his, um, his mother was transferred to Germany um, by the Soviet government. And uh, Zora stayed in Leningrad for about a year after his parents moved to Germany, uh, but eventually followed them and you know, settled in Berlin. And uh, this exposed him to kind of a whole new world of, of uh, automotive engineering and great engineering schools and so forth. Uh, Germany was quite a bit ahead of Russia when it came to especially the development of automobiles then. And in the fall of 1927, he enrolled at the University of Darmstadt with a major in electrical engineering. He soon switched to uh, mechanical engineering and uh, moved to the University of Charlottenburg, which was a very highly respected technical school in Germany. And while at the university, he designed a diesel tractor, which actually went into limited production. Also in Germany, here, uh, keep in mind that Zora was Jewish. And uh, so here he is in Germany at the rise of Hitler and so forth. But he, he has the resourcefulness to make friends with uh, probably the industry's very first racing czar, a guy by the name of Alfred Neubauer with Mercedes-Benz. And Neubauer was, you know, responsible for building some of the most advanced Grand Prix racing cars ever conceived. Both Auto Union and Mercedes really dominated Grand Prix racing back then. And some theorized they were actually getting support from the German government directly. But uh, it was difficult um, for Zora to land a position on the team if one was not German. And uh, it didn't help that Zora was also Jewish. But he made friends with uh, a good buddy of his, was a guy named Asia Orley, who uh, was the son of a banker and had money, was kind of a playboy type himself. And uh, he bought a number of MGs and set about racing them. And Zora became his kind of uh, right hand man. Uh, Orally usually did the driving. Zora got to race a few times, but Zora did most of the wrench work on the cars, preparing them for competition. It was in Berlin that um, Zora also met his lovely wife, Elfie, who I have to credit um, for giving me the opportunity to write this book. She was really the one who approached me originally and said, you know, would you would you consider this? Um, and a lot of, you know, Zora had talked to a lot of different people over the years about writing his biography, so it was kind of like a, uh, it was kind of a standing joke was which one of us was going to actually do it. And I guess I drew the lucky straw, I don't know. But um, anyway, uh, back in August 9th, 1935, that, that's where the two met, you know in a Berlin cafe. She was on her way to uh, meet another person on a date and she ducked in out of the rain and met Zora and the stars went flying and she was instantly in love. The two became inseparable and uh, even though Zora, thanks to his uh, liberal upbringing, you know, had a tendency to stray a bit, uh, she came, though, from a very artistic family. She was well-trained in ballet, and uh, you know, she was a, a good singer and a dancer. And uh, she would later become um, 
a prominent member of the Follies Berger dance troupe in Paris after they moved to Paris to get out of Germany because of Hitler. During uh, World War II, at least the early phases of World War II, uh, Zora joined the French Air Force, again where he trained as a bombardier, and uh, came to America on board a refugee ship after uh, the French Air Force kind of folded their tent and the Germans overran most of the country. Um, he immediately found work, as I said, uh, over in the States, as a, initially as a consultant. In fact, he, um, one of his first projects was uh, to analyze a polyharmonic damper that was being used in Navy ships. And he went on to do a lot of different consulting for companies like Remington Rand, and he had some really top security clearances because of his engineering skills, which is quite remarkable when you think about it. You know, here they are, here America was just on the verge of war, and, uh, um, but they, they needed the help. And then eventually, um, Zora and his brother Yura started their own war munitions company, which they called Arden, uh, which is a combination of Arcus and Duntoff. So after the war, um, the need for war munitions obviously diminished. And um, Zora and his brother thought, well, what are we going to do with all the our shops and our tooling and everything else. What can we build or make? And they took a look at the growing interest in hot rods in the post-war America and decided to offer an aftermarket uh, bolt-on overhead valve conversion kit for the Ford Flathead V8 engine. And uh, they hoped to sell the idea to Ford, especially as a means of increasing horsepower in Ford pickups. The reason they were looking at pickups was because there just wasn't enough room for the big overhead valve um, cylinder heads in most passenger cars. They worked in hot rods or trucks where you had a bigger engine bay. But despite high hopes, the business never takes off and Zora and Yura are forced to sell even though they developed a pretty credible product, but I think they needed Ford's help to really give it the kind of development testing that it deserved. And later some other hot rodders in Southern California played around with uh, those engines and eventually found a way to make them really work and they became kind of a standard for hot rodders for a number of years until ironically enough General Motors and uh, Chrysler and Ford all started building their own overhead valve uh, V8 engines. Indy 500, Zora in 47 and 48, Zora attempted to qualify in a pre-war Talbot that actually had doors that would open and shut. Um, and I don't know how many of you recognize the name of Luigi Canetti, but he became synonymous in this country with uh, the importation of Ferraris in New York. But before all that, he worked for, he initially worked for Zora at Arden and then became uh, Zora's chief mechanic at Indy. Uh, two years in a row, though, Zora was unable to uh, gather up enough speed to qualify. He was kind of really dealing with pre-war outdated equipment and no real budget. So after that, he hooked up with a man named Sidney Allard. Sidney Allard built sports cars in London uh, and you can kind of liken Sidney Allard really to an early Carroll Shelby. He uh, built some magnificent light roadster type sports cars and uh, used um, V8 engines, initially Ardens, uh, and that's kind of how they got to know each other. So they were using the Arden Ford uh, V8 and then he eventually started using Cadillac and uh, um, Chrysler engines. So Sidney Allard built hill climb cars as well as endurance cars out of a small shop in London. 
and then um, Zora worked for him as an engineer and later a racer. And when he was uh, went to Le Mans, you know, he was he was actually racing cars built by Sidney Allard in 1952 and 53. One of those years, the cars were actually owned by General Curtis LeMay, the, uh, the head of the United States Strategic Air Command. But uh, Allard was another very uh, underfunded operation in general. And uh, Zora, I think, longed to see what he could do with a really well-funded operation. So he returned to the United States in 1952, going to work for Fairchild Engineering. Um, and this was where he was assigned to work on that atomic compressor. And um, Fairchild at the time was trying to develop plans for an atomic-powered airplane. But I think we're probably all lucky that never came to fruition. <laughs> First encounter with a Corvette was again at the Motorama Show, 1953. Um, and uh, the car had such a warm response at that show that uh, GM put it into production. I, I theorized myself that GM had planned to put it into production all along, because I don't know how they could ramp up from January to May and be cranking cars out that quickly. But I could be wrong. So it was Lovett's first sight for Zora. You know, great looks, but again, two-speed automatic transmission. The Blue Flame 6 went back to the 1930s with Chevrolet. It was kind of their standard engine. Nothing very excited about it. This particular version had three side draft Webers, but or I'm sorry, uh, Carter carburetors. But uh, and it, again, it was a credible car for its day, but nothing particularly uh, um, noteworthy in terms of all-out performance. But once again, Zora knew what had a vision for what he thought he could do with the car. And uh, with that, he started at GM in May of 1953. Immediately gets into political trouble with his bosses for announcing that he has a commitment to drive uh, for a competitor at Le Mans, <laughs> Allard. And uh, Upon his return, he's, he's uh, assigned to work on school bus drivetrains out in Milford. <laughs> kind of their version of Siberia, I guess. You know? <laughs> yeah. But it wasn't long before he was back on the Corvette program. And uh, I think it was December. He started at GM in May 1st, 1953. I think it was in December that he wrote uh, a very significant memo called Thoughts Pertaining to Youth, Hot Rodding, and Chevrolet to his bosses at GM. And it was an extremely visionary document that GM and Chevy actually used as kind of a, the architecture for getting into the high performance parts business and really pushing uh, the performance aspects of their cars and uh, really developing uh, a good performance image. You know, Chevy had a, a really stodgy image for years and years and years. For, you know, Chevy regularly outsold Ford, but uh, after the war, you know, the market was changing and people were looking for brighter, more colorful, co more colorful, more powerful automobiles. And I think Ed Cole really saw that and responded to that. And uh, when Zora wrote this memo, uh, it was really amazingly perceptive of him because here's a guy that didn't have a whole lot of of uh, status within the company. He just, he was just an assistant staff engineer, but yet came in and was really starting to shake things up. And in the meantime, he uh, went to work on the Corvette, you know, started tuning the suspension and doing a number of tweaks to the car, and eventually, you know, became the champion of putting the small block Chevy V8 into the Corvette in 1955. But he wasn't done racing for other competitors. He actually raced for, uh, this time with Cole's blessing, he raced for Porsche in 1954, 55. Won his class driving a, a 1.1 liter 550 Spider. And uh, these were probably the two biggest racing wins of his career. 
And I think at the time you wonder, well, why did they allow him to race for Porsche if he was a GM engineer? And I think the answer to that, at least in my, my guess is, is that GM was starting to look very closely at air-cooled engines and uh, was starting to, they wanted, I think, to see what they could learn from Porsche. Zora came back and wrote some very uh, in-depth memos about what he was learning there, what Porsche was doing, how they were conducting the racing programs, and so forth. So I think GM got more out of the deal than uh, they realized. But eventually Zora had to start applying these learnings to what he was doing at Chevrolet. And one of the very first things he did was to set a record run up Pikes Peak in Colorado behind the wheel of a disguised 1956 Chevrolet. And uh, it was really Chevrolet's first real performance demonstration. He covered this 12.42 mile route in 17 minutes and 24 seconds and beat the old record by over two minutes, which is pretty significant. Campbell Ewald made a big ad campaign out of it. They actually had Burl Lives write a song about it. And it was pretty campy, but <laughs> it was cool. Next was uh, he broke a 150 mile an hour speed mark at Daytona Beach in Florida. And uh, one of the things he did in order to make the Chevy small block go that fast was apply a camshaft design that he had developed at Arden. And it was the exact same cam profile, and it worked like a charm in the small block Chevy. And it became known as the Duntoff cam. And 150 miles was an hour, you know, was a pretty high water mark. That was a big speed barrier to break. So people were excited about that. Then it was on to uh, developing fuel injection, which provided one horsepower for every cubic inch of engine displacement became an option on the 57 Chevy and the Corvette. And Zora earned three US patents for his contributions. He did not do this alone. He was working with a guy named John Dolza at, from Rochester Products. And uh, you know there were a lot of other people involved. Smokey Eunuch did a lot of the testing for them and so forth down in Florida. So um, you know it was, it was a significant effort, and yet still kind of a controversial technology back then because a lot of people felt that a big old four barrel carburetor would work just as well or better. But, but this is another area where you know the Corvette again kind of set the pathway for what the rest of the industry w was doing. So why didn't Zora race for Chevrolet if he was such a racing advocate? Well, um, Again, they didn't have that many opportunities uh, in the early 50s. That's why he was racing for competitors. And, um, you know, Zora was, was really hired to create a racing legacy, but I think they felt that his skills were too valuable to risk him getting hurt in a race car. So as much as he wanted to get behind the wheel, they weren't encouraging that. This uh, 1957 was really the first case where GM built a purpose-built race car. Uh, Zora led this effort. This was called the Corvette SS. Uh, it was designed to be uh, raced at uh, endurance races like the 12 Hours of Sebring, the 24 Hours of Le Mans. Um, they used a Mercedes-Benz 300 SL chassis to start off with, and then Zora applied a DDN uh, suspension to it. Um, and uh, Sterling Moss and uh, uh, Juan Fangio actually tested their mule car, their, their mule race car down at uh, Sebring and uh, came close to setting track records with the car. So Zora did a phenomenal job of uh, creating this, this potentially competitive race car. Unfortunately, um, the car they actually had to race didn't arrive from Detroit until two days before. And it came with this beautiful blue body on it, which was made out of magnesium. And um, unfortunately, they didn't, you know, 
back then Harley Earl really wanted to make a showing and uh, you know showcase GM's capability and so forth. And again, it's a beautiful car, but uh, again, it didn't have the um, it didn't have the development time on the racetrack that the the test car did. And as a result, they didn't last very long. They only lasted for 23 laps and succumbed to an ignition coil problem and a suspension problem. And unfortunately, right after that race, GM officially dropped out of factory racing program. So they never got a chance to really race that car again, in that configuration at least. Zora, though, became um, uh, quite an advocate of mid-engine cars. And he was actually sketching mid-engine cars as early as 1957, feeling that mid-engine cars represented the best way to get all-out performance, the best balance, the best road holding ability, et cetera. And uh, that was, that became kind of his campaign throughout his, the rest of his career was uh, he, he tried to champion a mid-engine Corvette. And GM built many prototypes such as this one here. Uh, that's the Aerovet there, I believe. That actually came with a, uh, that was originally built with a four, two four rotor Wankel engines. And he built many other um, Corvette concepts, Serve 1 and Serve 2, et cetera. But he was always thwarted by the design department that I think Bill Mitchell still preferred the long hooded front engine look. And he had more clout than Zora did. And this was this car here was a, just a classic example of uh, kind of how, even though Zora was very uh, instrumental in all of the great mechanical aspects of this car. Zora really thought this car should have been a mid-engine car and uh, had some legendary battles with the head of General Motors design, Bill Mitchell, over that split window. Uh, he hated it because as an engineer he thought, and a race driver, he thought it interfered, interfered uh, with rear visibility on a car. But as we all know, the Stingray became a cultural icon and uh, was the subject of many popular songs. Grand Sport was a racing version, of, of extreme lightweight version, uh, a thousand pounds lighter than a regular Corvette that Zora uh, used to take on the Ford Cobras and uh, really represented the peak of the Stingray's racing success, a very competitive car. Ironically, it never really won that much, but it was uh, it beat Ford at a couple of venues where it really mattered, and Chevrolet was able to get some big bragging rights out of it. Only five of these were built. Zora originally had hoped to build a hundred of them and sell them to customers to go racing themselves, uh, but uh, had the plug pulled on that effort because again, this racing ban was still going on. So Zora. Here's a case where Zora had to take some major risks in order to um, kind of maintain the performance image that he was trying to maintain. And uh, these cars, again, there were only five built. They are by far the most expensive Corvettes ever. I mean, you, I don't think you could buy one for much under $5 million a piece today. Zora was also uh, a very good engine developer, and he managed an engine group at GM, created many exotic uh, overhead cam V8s and multiple uh, valve configurations and so forth. Here he is pictured with uh, his engine team on the cover of Hot Rod Magazine in uh, 1962. Or 67, I'm sorry. Aerovet was his last great hope to sell the world on a mid-engine Corvette, again powered by a four-rotor engine, produced over 400 horsepower, and uh, really quite a magnificent looking car. I just saw that car at the Heritage Center a week ago. And it's still stunning when you see it in person with the gull wing doors and the window to the engine in the back.
Zora retired at the mandatory age of 65 in 1975. You know, he had hoped to continue on as a Corvette consultant, but his, his successor were, um, was uh, Dave McClellan, and Dave, rightfully enough, wanted to go his own way. So Zora began to consult for DeLorean. And John DeLorean was the former executive who started his own car company in, uh, in Ireland the famous DMC-12, stainless steel body, so forth, and hired Zora to be kind of a paid critic of the car. Zora really never had the opportunity to do that much hands-on engineering. And it was probably a good thing because DeLorean had everyone from Lotus's Colin Chapman to uh, Bill Collins from GM to uh, a guy named Mike Pocabello working on the car. There was just a number of different chefs in the kitchen and the car never really lived up to what it could have been and I don't think DeLorean ever was able to find a very good engine for it either. He ended up with a Renault engine. But uh, Zora certainly at, when, when he did retire he, cer he certainly wasn't ready to do so and uh, I think the, the later part of his life was very bittersweet for him. He you know, really enjoyed a lot of notoriety as a Corvette celebrity, attending many Corvette shows. Uh, he and Alfie would you know, sign autographs for hours for people, often served as an honorary judge, went to all the NCRS conventions, and a lot of NCCC events, was the guest of honor at the opening of the National Corvette Museum in uh, 1994. Um, kind of underwent a final push for fame by buying a BD-5 airplane in the mid-90s and it planned to st install a three-cylinder turbocharged uh, Chevy Metro engine in it and try to, tra try to break a piston-powered speed record at the Oshkosh Air Show in 96. But health problems prevented him from making that attempt. Unfortunately, the shot I have here is the, it's the right airplane, but that's a jet version of it. Zora, throughout his life, was a heavy smoker. Smoked unfiltered camels and pell-mells for years and had quit smoking in the mid-1990s but always maintained a really heavy smoker's cough. And in the summer of 1995, he was diagnosed with lung cancer. He did not go, uh, didn't undergo any treatment because of his age and uh, died in April 96. Um, at home at the age of 86 years old. So after all the, I, he took many more risks than I even have time to talk about tonight, but you know, it's uh, kind of ironic that he died at home close to his bedroom. So what do we take from Zora's life? I mean, well, I think he's an engineering genius without question you know, maverick, a risk taker, a great race driver, a man who made the Corvette into, you know, an international success, and probably one of the greatest automotive figures uh, in, in automotive history. You know, you think about the people he was competing against, you know, Porsche, Ferrari, and so forth. Those people had their names on the doors of the company. You know, Zora was working at a huge corporation where, uh, you know, unless you were uh, a senior executive or the president of the company, most people didn't know your name. And for, for him, who, you know, he didn't really, he didn't even get the uh, chief engineer title until 1968 because it just didn't exist prior to that. And uh, yet when you ask people out there in the world, you know, who Zora Duntoff was, if they're a car person, chances are they, they know damn well who he was. And I think that's pretty significant. I wanted to share um, that Zora did have some recent recognition in his homeland. Two years ago, an organization called the Alexander Solzhenitsyn Center for Russian Amigres uh, invited me to Moscow to help open up an exhibit um, in a large building there 
uh, over multiple rooms of Zora's life. And uh, I think they were um, quite taken by the fact that, you know, the real genius behind the Corvette was, turns out to be a Russian. And I think they take pride out of that, especially since they don't have much of, they, they really don't have any automotive industry left anymore. Um, but everyone around the world knows what a Corvette is. So, uh, you know, it's, it's had that kind of impact. As I said, the exhibit uh, drew a lot of interest. These are some shots of people strolling through. Uh, even a local Corvette showed up. This was owned by some guy in a rock band, but. <laughs> with a big Batman uh, decal on the hood. And so did a Camaro. Um, this, was, uh, this was actually provided by Chevrolet of Russia. They would have had a Corvette there, but they weren't selling Corvettes two years ago in Russia, and now they are. So, so that's here's yours truly, kind of giving uh, a PowerPoint overview on Zora's life. And I got to do some tourist stuff here, too. And uh, last slide, what's next? Um, uh, as as uh, Vicky mentioned, um, there was a Russian film crew here a couple weeks ago um, doing a documentary on Zora. And I kind of helped them uh, line up some interviews with people that Zora used to work with uh, Guys like Gib Hofstetter, who was Zora's, you know, kind of chief lieutenant, and then Denny Davis, who was in Zora's engine group, and uh, we went out to Pratt and Miller and saw the current Corvette racing operation. You know, to kind of contrast the new and the old. I took him out to Ken Lingenfelter's Corvette collection. I'm sure you've all been there at one time or another. Uh, took him out to Dave McClellan's home, and uh, I interviewed Dave there, and. Uh, so forth. So it was really kind of an interesting uh, experience. And this this is going to air uh, this coming November in front of like they say 50 million people. I don't know if they're really going to have an audience that big or not. But uh, uh, but it's you know as as Zora's biographer, I always felt a certain uh, responsibility to promote his name and to do everything I could to uh, keep his legacy going. And. Uh, to that end, too, I'm, I've been working on a screenplay and a, kind of a synopsis of Zora's life. I think that um, I, c I can hardly do it justice here. But uh, again, you think about the things that man had to overcome uh, and to, to have the kind of immortality that he does is really quite a remarkable story. And uh, so I'm hoping to bring that to life as a major motion picture at some point. So anyway, that's it. Um, I'll be happy to entertain any questions. Thank you for all staying awake. <laughs>